So I work in Mendocino and Lake Counties. It's an area of the northern part of California and the uh, North Coast AVA, our neighbors in Napa and Sonoma. And just for a point of reference, there's San Francisco and we're about 100 miles north of San Francisco and I work in these two counties. So this is a relief map and shows you that we're very hilly areas uh, and all of the processes of geological formation that you've been hearing about the last few days apply to us. Different parent materials and age of rocks, but pretty similar. And climatically, uh, we're a lot like Oregon, except that we have nice, nice weather where we are, and it doesn't rain so much in the winter. <laughs> and it gets warmer, so we can grow a little bit more fruit on each vine. This is Mendocino County. A two-third of our land area is covered with forests, a lot of Douglas fir and redwood trees on the west, where as we get close to the Pacific, it's cooler. And as we go to the east, it gets warmer, and then we're uh, more into an oak savanna woodland. And essentially, there's two major growing areas. One of them uh, is a, a cool area known as Anderson Valley, where we grow a lot of Pinot Noir and sparkling wine. And then there's a larger uh, interior area uh, uh, centered around the Russian River. And we have lots of water stored there. And we, we can irrigate, but we don't really need to irrigate that much most years. Uh, a neighboring Lake County and Clear Lake, we're going up in elevation. So this would be very much like uh, Southern Oregon, like Medford area. And we're at an elevation of about 300 meters or about 1,300 feet, uh, ranging to almost 2,000 feet or uh, 700 meters. And uh, in this area, we grow primarily uh, along the lake, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, and then in the upland areas, we are growing Cabernet Sauvignon. So we're going from basically parts of the county where you can't grow grapes it's, because it's too cold. And on the east side, uh, we're making kind of a trip through Winkler regions one through four, uh, and all over the distance of about 50 kilometers or 30 miles. Now, what I want to talk about uh, is regenerative agricultural systems. And essentially, these systems seek to promote soil and plant health by using photosynthesis for the removal and retention of atmospheric carbon dioxide into stable carbon. So I just want to say to you, Greg, that you're a wonderful scientist, but boy, is it depressing to listen to you. And I'm, I'm trying to give some people some hope as we leave here that there are things that you can do uh, to help change and mitigate this potential climate changes. And I, I think the scenario that the climatologists have painted is a really grim one if we don't get on the ball and start doing something. And that's a little bit what this talk is about, is what can we do? What is the big picture? Well, uh, this, this kind of shows it here. We can see how uh, essentially, essentially total carbon dioxide is, is growing. Uh, so we're getting up to almost 400 parts per million. And what we see happening that's also really bad is that deforestation is taking place, which is really terrible because the forests are an amazing sink for carbon dioxide. It's probably one of our most important ones on, on land. And uh, we're deforesting the earth, which is not really helpful at this time. Uh, other things I think that are interesting, if we look at contributions of who, where do we get the most CO2 from, from burning fossil fuels, and as transportation and electricity and heat uh, make up the largest percentage, and agriculture is probably contributing about 14%. Some of that's from uh, evaporation or uh, volatilization of carbon compounds from the soil, so tillage is making that happen, but it's also whatever other things we do, tractors and fertilizers. The thing that's really remarkable about carbon dioxide is it makes up a very small amount of our atmosphere. It's, it's less than 0.035%, and yet it's the whole basis of life because carbon has really special properties. With four valences, it's able to store amazing amounts of energy, and that's why life is really based on our planet because of that. Most of the rest of the atmosphere is nitrogen and oxygen, and uh, carbon dioxide would be next. So it's just quite remarkable that, that life evolved dependent on this gas. We have to rethink, at least in California and probably other places, the role that agriculture plays. And there's such competition for resources, particularly water in a populous state like ours, where we have uh, close to, to 38 million people living. And when we get into a drought situation, people want to know, what is it that agriculture does for us? And we have to start thinking about agriculture in our state as also providing ecological services. And some of these are quite important. 
a watershed, which we've heard about today. We should be able to protect soil and waterways and storing water, uh, and regenerating water into our uh, water, um, uh, subterranean water uh, aquifers. We also can be habitat for uh, diversity uh, of, of birds and mammals, and as well as a, a place for beneficial insects and pollinators to live. Sequestering carbon is a real potential ecological service that we can do. And I kind of pick on biodynamic and organic farming as systems that embrace a lot of these practices. And I'll talk about them because they're well-developed farming systems that extend from San Diego up to the Okanagan Valley. And many of the practices are similar, even though we go across a wide range of climates. So I'm going to talk just real quick about biodynamics. So it's a very holistic approach to farming, which is what I like about it. I'm not religious about it, and I, I don't really get into the preparations and the philosophy, but I'm kind of looking at energy flow and sort of ecological principles, and it has a lot of things going for it. So first of all, we talk about plant diversity, and uh, you know, we usually, biodynamic farms have a mixture of crops on them. Crop rotation is important, so even in perennial crops, so they rotate uh, cover crops, they do different cover crop strategies depending on the season, so it's not static, we're constantly changing what's planted underneath the vines. Uh, composting. Composting is a very, very important part of recycling agricultural waste and even urban waste and, and it's probably underutilized. Uh, it's something that I think uh, has a lot of potential for fixing carbon. Homeopathic solutions. This is the woo-woo part of, uh, of, of biodynamic agriculture and I can't tell you much about it. It really hasn't, I think it's been looked at a lot and I don't think we've really reached any real good conclusions. Uh, it's interesting that one theory is it might be chemical messaging to some of the microflora, which could be looked at. So that's something that probably will happen in the, the coming decade. Uh, animal life is really smart. Integrating animal agriculture into uh, plant agriculture is really useful because, first of all, you're harvesting the, the uh, forage in the field, so you, you don't have the energy of making hay. Uh, and you're also distributing the manure right there, so there's some very beneficial approaches to doing that. And it also really helps with vineyard floor management and canopy management. We can train the sheep to pull leaves for us, which is really wonderful. And we do it, and it's successful and cost effective. It costs about half of what it does to have a crew of humans do it. And life forces, this is another very, a uh, little bit esoteric thing uh, in biodynamics, which I don't spend a lot of time thinking about. You know, we recognize this, the sun cycle, uh, day and night and, and the year. But in biodynamics, they also look at other cycles. But that being said, it's not really required as part of what you have to do if you're going to be farming biodynamically. It's not written into the biodynamic, the Demeter farm standards, which is what you have to conform to if you decide to become certified. This is a pretty simple question. Is uh, soil important for wine flavor? And we spent a lot of time talking about that here at the conference. And I think we've all come to the conclusion, yeah, it, it affects things. And uh, you know, getting vine balance and having adequate nutrient and water for the plants to grow is important. OK, so if that's the case, is this all we need? Do we just need the drip system to put fertilizer through and just ignore the soil? Or is there more going on? Or should we think more about what's happening? So uh, this is something that if we take a look at uh, soils, I consider them to be the stomach of our ecosystem. So we may have uh, 120,000 uh, kilograms per hectare of all organic matter. And you can read down there. But what I think is interesting is the microbes make up almost 5,000 kilograms per hectare. So that's an area we really haven't spent a lot of time on because we really haven't had good techniques for doing that. But now that we're starting to uh, get genomics involved, and as Kimo was talking about, we'll probably see some changes in trying to understand that. In both of these systems, uh, they require the addition of organic matter. And that's really a big part of what you're doing is managing organic matter. So increasing organic matter is really, really important. And we do this three ways. So we do this with compost, cover crops, and then conservation tillage, where we seek to reduce uh, the amount of tillage that uh, we use. Some of our cover crop benefits we've gone over before, and I just agree with other previous speakers. You know, some of the immediate effects that we have on cover cropping is that we uh, uh, increase soil organic matter, and, and we also have uh, respiration rates go up. 
and there's many benefits. Uh, primarily farming humus and cycling nutrients is what I would say, and also suppressing pathogens and creating mycorrhizae uh, relationships. This shows real clearly, just look at the, the bottom two lines. So you can see that uh, in an organic and biodynamic systems, we really up the amount of, of carbon in the annual uh, carbon cycle uh, considerably and uh, going up anywhere from about uh, one to almost three tons uh, in the English system. And if we look at what we're trying to create long term is we want to make humus, which is a stable carbon formation. This is also kind of an eye-opener, is the amount of energy that goes into making fertilizer. You can see that it takes almost 75,000 BTUs to make uh, one kilogram of, of nitrogen versus about uh, 1,100 for uh, nitrogen when we use compost. So we're saving considerable considerable amount of, of energy and reducing um, the uh, input of energy on it. The microbiome I just want to talk about, this is something that we really haven't managed uh, yet, but we're starting to learn more about. So there's probably three microbiome zones, the phylosphere, what's on the leaves, the fruit, which we've heard about, uh, the, uh, and then the rhizosphere. So it's been tough to isolate these things, but now that we're going to have genomics available as a tool, that'll probably change. The rhizosphere is very, very active. There's its organizational chart. It does a lot of things for us in terms of cycling nutrients and water. And what happens in the soil can affect the whole plant. There's research that's showing that uh, the plant is, uh, can read this chemical messaging that's coming from bacterial populations that starts to grow and it can release phytoalexins like rosmeric acid. So what happens in the soil, a healthy soil and competition is something that could be uh, probably manipulated in the future. On the plant surfaces, like the phylosphere, uh, we have many different types of bacteria, and generally grape leaves don't have a lot. Uh, ice, nucleating bacteria, ice nucleating bacteria is something that I've worked with before, and this is something that uh, is an issue. We, we know that some leaves freeze during cold events, but others don't, and it's because of the presence of these bacteria that basically uh, help to, to make ice happen. And if we look at what's actually going on on leaf surfaces, we see that grapes don't support a lot of bacteria. This is a, a log 10 scale, where sink like grasses have huge amounts of bacteria. So if you're in a frosty area, you probably shouldn't have grasses in your vineyard during frost season. This was a study that we did, and if you look at the bottom, you can see that uh, these low lines are, are uh, places where we've sprayed copper, and, and this is how much the leaves were able to super cool because we killed the ice nucleating bacteria. Uh, microbes can be very specific to vineyard sites. Uh, Kimo talked a little bit about that. I think we've heard about that already, and this is one of the papers that says that you can actually trace it through to the wine with metabolites. Uh, so I won't dwell on that. And uh, I guess kind of summing up the biodynamic approach is that these preparations that they make are supposed to enhance plant life and soil life, and they rely on natural fermentations of wine. They're trying to make the farm somewhat uh, self-regulating for fertility and pest management, and in the end, you can make some pretty good wine. So there's an example of one of the wines made using biodynamic practices. I, I guess to sum it up, uh, one of my friends says, the vineyard is my orchestra and I am the conductor, and that's how he likes to look at it. And what he means by that is he thinks about things Systematically, he stands back and looks at his whole system and thinks about what am I doing in terms of managing fertility and how does that affect yield? How does it affect diseases? Uh, you know, what about the insects? Do they and they do? They respond when things are over fertilized or under fertilized or overwatered or underwatered. And that's part of your role as a vineyard manager is to uh, uh, manage that. And that is pretty much the. Uh, the idea behind a lot of these regenerative farming systems is to stand back and holistically look at what you're doing and not focus just on one thing. So that was a lot in a short period of time, but I, I do want to leave you with hope that we, we don't have, uh, we don't necessarily have to have the fate of burning up in the future. So uh, with our farming techniques, I think we can, can make things better. Thank you very much.